Hello, and welcome to the Motherhood Village podcast. I am on with a very special guest. I have Jamie Bleacher, the founder of Glitter Enthusiast. In 2016, while during the depths of her struggle with infertility, she grabbed a sterile IVF needle and began to use it to paint. Initially a distraction from her infertility struggle, sharing her art on social media became a platform for Jamie to embrace transparency. Revealing the inspiration behind her work garnered overwhelming support, transforming her from secrecy to a vibrant, supportive community. Jamie has a fashion merchandising degree from the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City, and she has over 15 years of buying experience, including retailers West Elm, Amazon, and Total Wine, and more in the home decor and gift space. Jamie now lives in Bethesda, Maryland with her husband, Brian, and her five-year-old twins, Ethan and Bennett, and Labradoodle Gem. Oh, I love that. Welcome, Jamie. How are you? <laughs> Hi, she's right here with me. <laughs> oh, I, I hear they're so sweet. Oh, Labradoodles are the best. But it was it's so nice to talk to you. I'm so excited to be on. We met at Founders Weekend, and that was of Entrepreneurs to Founders Weekend, who have, yes. for anyone who isn't familiar, it was a blast. It was. I'm still kind of, a lot of those events, I kind of come back maybe feeling a little overwhelmed or yeah. I should have or could have, but I think yeah. I left so inspired, motivated, and just like ready to tackle on things. I was, yeah. it, it was a very uplifting experience. It really was. And I was expecting it to be, I was really thinking about the uplifting aspects of it and the motivational aspects, but I wasn't thinking about the educational aspects of it. And I came out really educated. I came out learning some great new skills, learning about new platforms that we should be working on with Shopify, et cetera, like things that are super tangible that I'm ready to tackle and we're already tackling. So I feel really good about it. But also, yeah, I get the shoulda, woulda, coulda, pradas of the world. That's like all of us. I feel like that is motherhood, right? Oh, wait, that's like yeah. motherhood yeah. entrepreneurs. A thousand percent. But I agree. I think the educational part, I really have to give kudos to Stephanie and Courtney for mm -hmm. being able to bridge both of them, the education, the mm -hmm. fun and uplifting. They did a fantastic job. They but, really okay. did. And fun. it brought us but together. Yes. So, yes. So before we jump into your story, I want you to share. I always like to ask my guests to share their favorite book. And it doesn't have to be one, it could be multiple or anything that you feel really impacted you that you want to share with my listeners. Okay. So I thought about this a little bit and I have read business books and merchandising books. Why I Buy is something I've read. I read a long time ago that was really impactful, especially when I was in fashion school. But the book that has impacted me the most, and it's very recent, is called Work of Art. It's of assisted reproductive technology. And it is a book written by my friend Ali Prado. And she has her own podcast, Fertility Rally. And she has written a book for children about IVF and how they came to be. And I know that's kind of a weird answer because we're talking about business and we're talking about, you know, our businesses. But it really, it was really inspirational to me and really impactful that my kids can tell their stories from a young age. It's super cool. And now you ask them how they, like, I say, what's IVF? And they say, it's just another way to make a baby. And then they kind of go into it, the science of it, which I found so mesmerizing, honestly. I actually love that because I think when we hear fertility, when we hear IVF, I think there are so many misconceptions. Mm -hmm. I think to your point, which was in your bio about right. like, maybe you were kind of suffering in silence and now you found the supportive community. Mm -hmm. I think it's even still not as on the forefront as it should be. We're still not talking about it as much, which is why I wanted to speak about it on my podcast. But I love that. And I think that's so beautiful. And I'm glad you mentioned it because now if I do have a mother that is going through it or even has gone through it, and maybe she's like, what if my kids ask me and how can I share their story? So thank you for sharing that. I think that's very powerful. Okay, let's jump in. So glitter enthusiast. Now, yes, I would share a quick story. When I saw you at the vendor marketplace for the Entreprenista Founders Weekend, and I saw you, I think you were painting, you were mm -hmm. doing something. And I saw the story and I'm like, what is this? And you <laughs> very high level explained, well, through my own IVF journey, like you kind of, and I was like, wait, what? I'm like, that is fantastic. And I actually told a couple of people about it here. And they were like, oh my God, that's so beautiful. I'm like, I know. So I'm talking with her on the podcast. But Share more about that moment when you did decide to use the IVF needles as a paintbrush and how kind of the creativity behind it was really an outlet to help you cope with the infertility struggle. 
and what you've learned during this process. I think mm. that, let's start with that because I think it's such a beautiful statement or just so many things to use kind of the struggle and kind of coming out on the other side. So talk to me about that. Yeah, well, thank you. And that was a great, that was <laughs> what a great question. Okay, so let's take us back to 2016. I've been painting since I was little. I've been doing art since forever. And I use art to vent. I use art as a way to get out my emotions. I'm not, I'm silly and I'm, I I would call myself powerful, but I'm not combative. I'm not, I'm not controversial. I'm not, you know, I, I have trouble fighting back. I have trouble asking questions. I have trouble, I have trouble advocating. I've learned so much in the past like 10 years to advocate for myself. But at the time I just felt stuck. I felt alone and stuck. And now everyone's talking about IVF or I think everyone's talking about IVF because I talk about it so much and it's still untalked about 10 years ago, not talked about. I was the first person going through IVF in my mind. I was the only one that I could relate to going through IVF. And my entire Instagram feed was full of babies and bumps. And my therapist was like, you should create another Instagram that's like only full of your happy place. And I was like, oh, I'll call it glitter enthusiast because that I love sparkly things. And that was a happy place for me. And that's kind of where I would go. And when I was painting at home, you know, when you go through IVF, you get a bajillion needles unused. And I looked at the corner of my eye and I saw a needle and I was like, what if I put paint in here? What if I put alcohol in here? What would happen? I was expecting a big old nothing burger. And what came out was living metaphor all of a sudden. It was like, I am taking, (laughs) my husband was like, you're so weird. I was like, I am taking power. I'm taking the power back. I'm taking control. It is my journey. I can put what I want through this needle. And it's the same kind of needles that I'm using to inject myself full of hormones that is causing me so much pain, frustration, anger, confusion, loneliness, hardship, and making something beautiful out of it. All of a sudden, I had the power to change my future and make it my own and make it beautiful and make this journey mine. So where I felt like a prisoner of this journey, I think. And then I started sharing it on Instagram and I was bursting out of the infertility closet. So I was like, this is me bursting. I think I said that, (laughs) me bursting out of the infertility closet. I've been going through infertility for, I think it's two years now at this point, this was like right after an, a second miscarriage. And it was just a, you know, people think IVF equals baby. IVF equals opportunity. That's what I think. It's, you still go through so much. It's not guaranteed to work. And if it works, you might lose. Like I, I actually was pregnant with twin boys and lost them. And then late years later, spoiler alert, had twin boys, but which was, yeah, which is crazy. But at the time, sharing it was super impactful and helpful. And if I was like, if I could help myself and help one other person, and I got 44 messages that day. And it was like, I went through infertility 30 years ago and I couldn't talk about it. And I never had a baby. And it would be like one of my mom's friends or people who I went to high school with. I'm going through this now. This is just how I had my child. I know I have PCOS, so I might have these problems in the future. And it opened up this world to this conversation that I thought wasn't possible and all of a sudden became possible. So I started connecting with all of these other people going through infertility online. And then it's been blossoming from there. It's just a really cool journey. And now I paint with my kids. I have twin boys. They're five and they are hilarious and they know all about mommy's job. And this is just so normal to them that mommy would paint with an IVF needle because she wanted a baby so badly. And now she shows others how the journey is possible. Like they, they say it in different ways, but they know it. Sure. There's so much I want to impact there because (laughs) I know that was a lot. (laughs) No, because I'm like, where do I even begin? Yeah. So talk to me because you said I want to talk a little bit, if you don't mind, because I I want Mm -hmm. to eliminate some of the the misconceptions about IVF. Mm -hmm. Like you have the Mm -hmm. platform here. Let's talk about it, right? Yeah. So you mentioned it really is opportunity. I know a woman right now who's going through it, actually two. 
Mm-hmm. One, she's looking to it. She's kind of going through a little bit more of the holistic route kind of thing. And then I have oh. another woman who's two are tied. She does have two children. So she comes from a blended family. Her husband came with two kids, her new husband. She has two kids, but now they're looking to possibly have one together, but her tubes are tied. So that's a whole thing. And she's dealing with a lot of emotions there. So talk to me about, and I guess I'll say it honestly here. So I'm 40 and I'm looking to possibly have my second. But the first time, transparent, we got pregnant very quickly. Very thankful for that. But I say that because now that I am 40, I'm like, well, what is the what ifs? What is this? And I'm like, wow, is this how women felt that maybe if they were trying for some time and they're like, wait, it's not coming for me. What does that mean? Is there something wrong with me? What options do I have? So I think it is very important to say, so my question to you is you mentioned it's an option for opportunity. That's really all it is when you're going through this IVF journey. But it sounds like there's also a lot of grief that comes with it because you mentioned miscarriages, you mentioned losing to like, I could only imagine. Talk to me about how that power, though, how connecting with these communities, how receiving those messages really pulled you through so that if there is still a listener listening to this and didn't realize that there's someone like you out there, didn't realize that maybe there's a group out there that can help them, how you really got through that, because I can only imagine the excruciating pain with it because there is so much grief and that's the best word that I could describe because I think grief and motherhood is you know we grieve our past selves then I'm sure then once you become a mom Mm -hmm. then you're like oh wow now I you know now I have two and there's so much that is on that's why I was like a lot to unpack so maybe just let's start there for someone listening to this how was it to kind of come through the other side and I guess, what do you recommend to someone who's kind of going through that journey and things and resources that they can do for themselves to kind of, I guess, get through it? If they are going through any of the grieving stuff, talk to me about that experience because I think it's important. I I think that it's important to, there's and there's a lot about to unpack there too, but there is, it, it is important to know that one in six couples deal with infertility. Think about that. One in six couples, my kids are in a class of 17 kids. That's it. Like one in six couples. So that is more than two of those kids. Like it is so interesting to me how common it is. And for me sharing, I felt like all of a sudden I had a rally behind me. I had a troop behind me cheering me on. And I think that's what I needed. I think I needed a tribe. For me, I'm a community person. So doing something on my own, being the first to do something, I thought in my mind I was the first to of my friend group to do IVF, untrue. But for me to think that was stunting, very stunting for me. You asked about resources if you're going through infertility. There are so many groups online that are beautiful. I, was, I mentioned Ali Prado before, a fertility rally. That's a whole group of people going through infertility. And I teach classes virtually to to women going through infertility with their own IVF needles so they can paint themselves. So my advice would be to find those people online, find that tribe and to feel a part of something. It is hard. It is hard because there are people, you might have successes and that would be hard for someone else online. You might have a miscarriage and someone else is getting pregnant who's in that tribe. And that's hard too. Like all of it is hard, but you're on the journey together and you'll come out the other side of it together. I wear this IVF mama shirt and so many people come up to me and I'm always like, like, we need to talk about that, the success stories too. But my other piece of advice, which I always tell people is find your joy, find something that makes you feel like you, because you, all of a sudden you feel like this lab rat. You could, I did. I felt like I went and got pricked every day. I came home and did needles to myself every night. Like, and along with my regular job where I had to act totally normal, except some days I would just sit there crying at the stapler and like, just not feel like a, like myself. I just didn't feel like myself, but painting felt like myself and creating felt like myself and sharing online and talking to people felt like myself. So that, that really brought me back, I think. And I have the most supportive husband, but he is not the person to be like, are you ready for this? We're in this together. We're going to do it. He's like, you're the leader. I'm the co-pilot. Whatever you want. You want me to give you shots? Great. 
we're going to get through it. It's going to, and there were some days where I'm like, are you in this with me? Because I felt like if I had a loss, he wasn't upset about it, but he was, and he just didn't want to upset me. So I needed to find my people that totally 100% got it. Oh my God, yes. So let me, so now you have your babies, but do you still paint with your IVF needles? Talk to me yeah. about that. So yeah. yeah. Talk, and is that a painting that you've created behind you? Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. Beautiful. Oh my God, Thank they're you. so beautiful. So yeah. Thank so do you, you still do you use old needles? Like talk to me about your process yeah. now that your little ones have come and you, you they came, they're here. What changed in your approach to painting? Like, talk yeah. to me about that. So now you're painting, you're using the needles yeah. as a source of, you know, inspiration. You're getting through this. You're like, you know what? I'm going to use it as power. I'm not, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take this. I'm going to take these IVF needles and use it for something good. But now your little ones are here. So talk to me about your painting process from before and then after. Yeah. So now, well, I, I think I'll talk about after a little bit because now I, I think of it as celebration. I'm always, I will always paint with IVF needles. It is so important to speak about, out about this hard subject. And this is my best way. I'm not as good with words. I'm good with pictures. And this is my best way to speak out and have my voice and have a platform and be visible. And I paint with other people's needles. So I get and all unused. I never like use a needle that someone else has used. It's all always unwrapped, but I am donated needles all over the country from all over the country. Women that going through IVF needles. When I teach classes, I always say we are honoring all of these people going through IVF. People have graciously donated their unused needles so we can paint with them and honor them. And it's more symbolic. And then I paint for other people's nurseries with their needles so they'll send me their needles and then I paint um, a painting for above the crib or somewhere in the nursery near where you're reading the book. So we can always be like, we're reading the art book. And this was created with your IVF needles, with IVF needles that I got in my kit to create you. How cool is that? I do a lot of push presents, which is cool, where the husbands or the spouses or a friend will secretly send me the needles and paint for that person's nursery. And that is always like, to me, the coolest because it's like, it's just so celebratory. But for myself, it is very celebratory. So it sounds like you kind of pivoted, you evolved and talk to me. So I want to get to the business aspect of yeah. it in the sense of, because I think it's so inspiring. So you do have an extensive background and do, you still work, I think, in some merchandising and stuff, don't you? Yeah. Talk to me like how your background from that yeah. and then building this brand and how it's been really turning it into a business or do you not? Do you still like talk to me about it? Is it a brand that you're trying to grow? Do you want it to be like, you know, glitter enthusiast and you want it all over and in a gallery? Oh my God, I can see it in a gallery with different paintings and all these things, you know? I think manifest, it's beautiful with like, pictures of women. <laughs> Yes, with pictures of women who have gone through it, you know, of like raw photos. And then there's this like beautiful, like, like I, that's kind of how my brain works. But yeah, talk to me about what it's been like transitioning it into like a business and taking your background into um, merchandising and styling and then growing this beautiful company and brand. Yeah. So yeah, I have an extensive merchandising background. My most recent job is um, at Total Wine for eight years, running their gifts and glassware department. So very creative. So we have taken my paintings. So this is a print behind me. It's not an original. We take my paintings and my best friend and business partner, Ashley Fisher, photographs the work. And then we put them on all of these different things. So, so we have prints, we have headbands, towels, we have all kinds of stickers. So we digitally use my art and create all these really cool, fun things. And then we have. So that's your art. So that yeah. is actually art. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I love and then that. Yes. We, we've done licensing and partnerships. So this is a company called Milkmaid Skin. It's really cool. Look it up. Milkmaid Skin. And it's created using the, the properties of breast milk, but they were recreated in a lab. So it's not actually breast milk, but it, used, it has the healing properties and it's awesome. Awesome. Um, so we did art for that packaging. We've done infertility cards of affirmation with Encircle Fertility. So each card has a beautiful saying, I'm stronger than the struggle. This is just a roller coaster right now. It's not the rest of my life. Things like that. 
which is super helpful. And I always give to people who are struggling. So we are growing and we're selling prints. We're at markets and really taking it to the next level and using my merchandising background to understand the supply chain aspect of that and the ROI aspect of it, everything like that to grow it. And I think that it will be a, a very important brand, much like a, a Lily Pulitzer or a Rifle Paper. My big dream is to be on Little Sleepies or Caden Lane pajamas and have, we have like we have patterns with all of our with all of our rainbows or our disco balls, whatever it is, that people can know the meaning behind it, that this was, it's a labor of love. It's a labor of love. I'm sure there's got to be an entrepreneur that is selling like kids pajamas or pajamas. I know, I need to put something yeah. out. And that should be something because I think that would be fantastic. And then like a portion of the thing gets donated yeah. to like a, a organization. So, and that's what we do. A portion of all sales on our website, glitterenthusiast.com go to various fertility organizations. One of them being Resolve, which is the leading advocacy group for infertility. And they're right here in DC. And tell me about, I guess, the work that they do. Maybe just give them a little. So if there is anyone yeah. listening, please tell me about what they do and why you feel inclined to kind of support them. I love them because they are an advocacy group. They are law facing, but also patient facing where they help people understand their options, help people in the LGBTQ plus space understand their options and how they can pay for IVF, et cetera. I love Resolve, but there are so many other organizations that we are committed to. Fertility Dreams Foundation is one of them. And they are wonderful. They give grants to people who can't afford IVF. IVF is expensive. And that sucks. <laughs> that really sucks. We are also pairing up with this company called Gaia. They're out of the UK and they're coming to the US and I'll be live painting in June at their welcome party. But they are a company that's an infertility insurance policy. So basically they work with different clinics and they get the best rates. And then you have eight years to pay them back which is really cool thinking about an infertility insurance policy. Like we did not think about these things when I was going through it. It was kind of a scramble, right? So thinking about that you have this opportunity to have a child, even if you don't feel like you have the funds to do so because you got that tick and clock and you feel like those are your options at the moment, you know? So talk to me about the future of fertility. How do you see it? What do you think needs to change? I think organizations like yourself, businesses like yourself, the collaborations, all of that, like that's fantastic having conversations like this. And two, if we have friends, if we have family going through it, what's a good thing we can do to show support, to show so solidarity for them? So the future of fertility, there's so much going on and so many things that you hear in the news right now because IVF is in jeopardy right now. And I was actually talking the other day to the first IVF baby, Elizabeth Carr, and she's so cool. She was born in 1981, believe it or not. And she she was saying how sometimes she feels like an endangered species because of how IVF can just be taken away from by the Supreme Court like that, you know, but it seems like everything is okay. <laughs> but I would say going back to like, high school health class. We don't talk about infertility. We only talk about how to have a kid, how to not have a kid. But we don't talk about all of the, everything in between. There's one in six people, one in six couples who face infertility. Like we should be talking about this much earlier. And I think that's a huge fix and also will inspire the young minds of this generation who are, who have robotics, who have all of these really cool things that we never got to learn in our generation to and inspire them to do better. Want to throw in there then a part B of that. Do you think having that early discussion could also help with just learning more about your body? Because you hear yes. women with ECOs, you hear women that have these things yes. that if I would have just known 20 years yes. ago, we could have prepared. So is that why you think those conversations? Yes. Start? Okay. I would have banked eggs earlier. There are so many things. I have PCOS. What does that mean? It doesn't mean PCOS doesn't mean you're not going to have a kid. It's just another obstacle. So knowing that about your body and teenage women do know that about their bodies. So what do you do with that information? No one is sharing that right now. I love your question about what to do, how to comfort someone, how to hold space for someone going through infertility in your life, because I think those questions are not asked. And I come from a 
a lovely, beautiful Jewish community, a lot of beautiful, wonderful yentas, and they want to know when you're having a kid, when you're having a kid, et cetera. So having these conversations, being able to even explain that this is a thing that's going on is really cool. What I would say to someone who has a sister going through infertility, I would say they're on a roller coaster and you are holding their bags. You know, they, you are taking the pictures, you're holding their bags. You let them have the conversations. You let them bring it up. You say, how are you doing today? Not how are you doing? How are you doing today? How can I be safe for you? Let's just go to Costco and not talk about any of this shit. And let's just have fun. Like this thing can be all encompassing. You wake up and you get your monitoring and then you're waiting for some news and then you do shots at home at night. Like it takes over your life. And all I needed at the time, besides a a beautiful community to talk to about this and empathize with, I needed friends who were non-judgmental. I needed friends who just were for me. Thank you for sharing that because I think it's important. And I, I think we need to be able to hold space for everyone. And just because someone's journey could be different or just being uneducated or misinformed, you know, like there's so much. But I think if you come from a good space to say, yeah, like, let's just hang out. I'm yeah. here. I think that goes such a long way. So before we kind of bring it all together here, share how people can connect with you, share how people can buy these beautiful products, how they can work with you, share all yeah. of the things. So any licensing, anything like that, info at glitterenthusiast.com. We have an Instagram, TikTok, everything. It is all Glitter Enthusiast. And our website is glitterenthusiast.com. Right there, there's a space on there for commissions. Also, you can purchase products that we've created, all going to beautiful places and making the world a little more colorful and a little more kind. Yeah, follow us. We're fun. Yes, no, I don't put it all in the show notes. Okay, I always ask my guests to share their final thoughts. So if you have to kind of take away and say, listen, I really want to end with this. This is your moment to kind of share any final thoughts or things that you're like, I really want to make sure that you understood this or whatever that is. I think my biggest thought and what I would share with everyone is that hard times happen. You're still yourself and you can still use the creative tools within yourself to find strength, find beauty and move forward. So beautiful. Thank you so much, Jamie, for coming on, for sharing your story, for the work that you do. I cannot wait for this episode to post and to tag and to just further the conversation and information. So thank you and continued blessings to you for love and life.